preface an attempt at self-criticism one whatever may lie at the bottom of this doubtful book must be a question of the first rank and attractiveness moreover a deeply personal question in proof thereof observe the time in which it originated in spite of which it originated the exciting period of the franco-german war of eighteen seventy to seventy one while the thunder of the battle of worth rolled over europe the ruminator and riddle lover who had to be the parent of this book sat somewhere in a nook of the alps lost in riddles and ruminations consequently very much concerned and unconcerned at the same time and wrote down his meditations on the greeks the kernel of the curious and almost inaccessible book to which this belated prologue or epilogue is to be devoted a few weeks later and he found himself under the walls of metz still wrestling with the notes of interrogation he had set down concerning the alleged cheerfulness of the greeks and of greek art till at last in that month of deep suspense when peace was debated at versailles he too attained to peace with himself and slowly recovering from a disease brought home from the field made up his mind definitely regarding the birth of tragedy from the spirit of music from music music and tragedy greeks and tragic music greeks and the artwork of pessimism a race of men well fashioned beautiful envied life inspiring like no other race hitherto the greeks indeed the greeks were in need of tragedy yea of art wherefore greek art we can thus guess where the great note of interrogation concerning the value of existence had been set is pessimism necessarily the sign of decline of decay of failure of exhausted and weakened instincts as was the case with the indians as is to all appearance the case with us modern men and europeans is there a pessimism of strength an intellectual predilection for what is hard awful evil problematical in existence owing to well-being to exuberant health to fullness of existence is there perhaps suffering in overfulness itself a seductive fortitude with the keenest of glances which yearns for the terrible as for the enemy the worthy enemy with whom it may try its strength from whom it is willing to learn what fear is what means tragic myth to the greeks of the best strongest bravest era and the prodigious phenomenon of the dionysian and that which was born thereof tragedy and again that of which tragedy died the socratism of morality the dialectics contentedness and cheerfulness of the theoretical man indeed might not this very socratism be a sign of decline of weariness of disease of anarchically disintegrating instincts and the hellenic cheerfulness of the later hellenism merely a glowing sunset the epicurean will counter to pessimism merely a precaution of the sufferer and science itself our science i viewed as a symptom of life what really signifies all science whither were still whence all science well is scientism perhaps only fear and evasion of pessimism a subtle defence against truth morally speaking something like falsehood and cowardice and unmorally speaking an artifice 
o oh, socrates socrates was this perhaps thy secret o oh, mysterious ironist was this perhaps thine irony two what i then laid hands on something terrible and dangerous a problem with horns not necessarily a bull itself but at all events a new problem i should say to-day it was the problem of science itself science conceived for the first time as problematic as questionable but the book in which my youthful ardour and suspicion then discharged themselves what an impossible book must needs grow out of a task so disagreeable to youth constructed of naught but precocious unripened self-experiences all of which lay close to the threshold of the communicable based on the groundwork of art for the problem of science cannot be discerned on the groundwork of science a book perhaps for artists with collateral analytical and retrospective aptitudes that is an exceptional kind of artists for whom one must seek and does not even care to seek full of psychological innovations and artists secrets with an artist's metaphysics in the background a work of youth full of youth's metal and youth's melancholy independent defiantly self-sufficient even when it seems to bow to some authority and self-veneration in short a firstling work even in every bad sense of the term in spite of its senile problem affected with every fault of youth above all with youth's prolixity and youth's storm and stress on the other hand in view of the success it had especially with the great artist to whom it addressed itself as it were in a duologue with richard wagner a demonstrated book i mean a book which at any rate sufficed for the best of its time on this account if for no other reason it should be treated with some consideration and reserve yet i shall not altogether conceal how disagreeable it now appears to me how after sixteen years it stands a total stranger before me before an eye which is more mature and a hundred times more fastidious but which has by no means grown colder nor lost any of its interest in that self-same task essayed for the first time by this daring book to view science through the optics of the artist and art moreover through the optics of life three i say again to-day it is an impossible book to me i call it badly written heavy painful image angling and image entangling maudlin sugared at times even to feminism uneven in tempo void of the will to logical cleanliness very convinced and therefore rising above the necessity of demonstration distrustful even of the propriety of demonstration as being a book for initiates as music for those who are baptized with the name of music who are united from the beginning of things by common ties of rare experiences in art as a countersign for blood relations in artibus a haughty and fantastic book which from the very first withdraws even more from the profanum vulgus of the culture than from the people but which also as its effect has shown and still shows knows very well how to seek fellow enthusiasts and lure them to new byways and dancing grounds here at any rate thus much was acknowledged with curiosity as well as with aversion a strange voice spoke the disciple of a still unknown god who for the time being had hidden himself under the hood of the scholar under the german's gravity and disinclination for dialectics even under the bad manners of the wagnerian here was a spirit with strange and still nameless needs a memory bristling with questions experiences and obscurities beside which stood the name dionysus like one more note of interrogation here spoke people said to themselves with misgivings something like a mystic an almost 
mematic soul which undecided whether it should disclose or conceal itself stammers with an effort and capriciously as in a strange tongue it should have sung this new soul and not spoken what a pity that i did not dare to say what i then had to say as a poet i could have done so perhaps or at least as a philologist for even at the present day well nigh everything in this domain remains to be discovered and disinterred by the philologist above all the problem that here there is a problem before us and that so long as we have no answer to the question what is dionysian the greeks are now as ever wholly unknown and inconceivable for i what is dionysian in this book may be found an answer a knowing one speaks here the votary and disciple of his god perhaps i should now speak more guardedly and less eloquently of a psychological question so difficult as the origin of tragedy among the greeks a fundamental question is the relation of the greek to pain his degree of sensibility did this relation remain constant or did it veer about the question whether his ever-increasing longing for beauty for festivals gaieties new cults did really grow out of want privation melancholy pain for suppose even this to be true and pericles or thucydides intimates as much in the great funeral speech whence then the opposite longing which appeared first in the order of time the longing for the ugly the good resolute desire of the old helene for pessimism for a tragic myth for the picture of all that is terrible evil enigmatical destructive fatal at the basis of existence whence then must tragedy have sprung perhaps from joy from strength from exuberant health from overfulness and what then physiologically speaking is the meaning of that madness out of which comic as well as tragic art has grown the dionysian madness what perhaps madness is not necessarily the symptom of degeneration of decline of belated culture perhaps there are a question for alienists neuroses of health of folk youth and youthfulness what does that synthesis of god and goat in the satyr point to what self-experience what stress made the greek think of the dionysian reveller and primitive man as a satyr and as regards the origin of the tragic chorus perhaps there were endemic ecstasies in the eras when the greek body bloomed and the greek soul brimmed over with life visions and hallucinations which took hold of entire communities entire cult assemblies what if the greeks in the very wealth of their youth had the will to be tragic and were pessimists what if it was madness itself to use a word of plato's which brought the greatest blessings upon hellas and what if on the other hand and conversely at the very time of their dissolution and weakness the greeks became always more optimistic more superficial more histrionic also more ardent for logic and the logicizing of the world consequently at the same time more cheerful and more scientific i despite all modern ideas and prejudices of the democratic taste may not the triumph of optimism the common sense that has gained the upper hand the practical and theoretical utilitarianism like democracy itself with which it is synchronous be symptomatic of declining vigour of approaching age a physiological weariness and not at all pessimism was epicurus an optimist because a sufferer we see it is a whole bundle of weighty questions which this book has taken upon itself let us not fail to add its weightiest question viewed through the optics of life what is the meaning of morality five already in the foreword to richard wagner 
art and not morality is set down as the properly metaphysical activities of man in the book itself the piquant proposition recurs time and again that the existence of the world is justified only as an aesthetic phenomenon indeed the entire book recognizes only an artist thought and artist afterthought behind all occurrences a god if you will but certainly only an altogether thoughtless and unmoral artist god who in construction as in destruction in good as in evil desires to become conscious of his own equable joy and sovereign glory who in creating worlds frees himself from the anguish of fullness and overfulness from the suffering of the contradictions concentrated within him the world that is the redemption of god attained at every moment as the perpetually changing perpetually new vision of the most suffering most antithetical most contradictory being who contrives to redeem himself only in appearance this entire artist metaphysics call it arbitrary idle fantastic if you will the point is that it already betrays a spirit which is determined some day at all hazards to make a stand against the moral interpretation and significance of life here perhaps for the first time a pessimism beyond good and evil announces itself here that perverseness of disposition obtains expression and formulation against which schopenhauer never grew tired of hurling beforehand his angriest implications and thunderbolts a philosophy which dares to put derogatorily put morality itself in the world of phenomena and not only among phenomena in the sense of the idealistic terminus technicus but among the illusions as appearance semblance error interpretation accommodation art perhaps the depth of this anti-moral tendency may be best estimated from the guarded and hostile silence with which christianity is treated throughout this book christianity as being the most extravagant burlesque of the moral theme to which mankind has hitherto been obliged to listen in fact to the purely aesthetic world interpretation and justification taught in this book there is no greater antithesis than the christian dogma which is only and will be only moral and which with its absolute standards for instance its truthfulness of god relegates that is disowns convicts condemns art all art to the realm of falsehood behind such a mode of thought and valuation which if at all genuine must be hostile to art i always experienced what was hostile to life the wrathful vindictive counter-will to life itself for all life rests on appearance art delusion optics necessity of perspective and error from the very first christianity was essentially and thoroughly the nausea and surfeit of life for life which only disguised concealed and decked itself out under the belief in another or better life the hatred of the world the curse on the affections the fear of beauty and sensuality another world invented for the purpose of slandering this world the more at bottom a longing for nothingness for the end for rest for the sabbath of sabbaths all this as also the unconditional will of christianity to recognize only moral values has always appeared to me as the most dangerous and ominous of all possible forms of a will to perish at the least as the symptom of a most fatal disease of profoundest weariness despondency exhaustion impoverishment of life for before the tribunal of morality especially christian that is unconditional morality life must constantly and inevitably be the loser because life is something essentially unmoral indeed oppressed with the weight of contempt and the everlasting no 
life must finally be regarded as unworthy of desire as in itself unworthy morality itself what may not morality be a will to disown life a secret instinct for annihilation a principle of decay of depreciation of slander a beginning of the end and consequently the danger of dangers it was against morality therefore that my instinct as an intercessory instinct for life turned in this questionable book inventing for itself a fundamental counter dogma and counter valuation of life purely artistic purely anti-christian what should i call it as a philologist a man of words i baptized it not without some liberty for who could be sure of the proper name of the antichrist with the name of a greek god i called it dionysian six you see which problem i ventured to touch upon in this early work how i now regret that i had not then the courage or immodesty to allow myself in all respects the use of an individual language for such individual contemplations and ventures in the field of thought that i laboured to express in kantian and schopenhauerian formulae strange and new valuations which ran fundamentally counter to the spirit of kant and schopenhauer as well as to their taste what forsooth were schopenhauer's views on tragedy what gives he says in welt aus villa und verstellung to four ninety five to all tragedy that singular swing towards elevation is the awakening of the knowledge that the world that life cannot satisfy us thoroughly and consequently is not worthy of our attachment in this consists the tragic spirit it therefore leads to resignation oh how differently dionysus spoke to me oh how far from me then was just this entire resignationism but there is something far worse in this book which i now regret even more than having obscured and spoiled dionysian anticipations with schopenhauerian formulae to wit that in general i spoiled the grand hellenic problem as it had opened up before me by the admixture of the most modern things but i entertained hopes where nothing was to be hoped for where everything pointed all too clearly to an approaching end that on the basis of our latter-day german music i began to fable about the spirit of teutonism as if it were on the point of discovering and returning to itself i at the very time that the german spirit which not so very long before had had the will to the lordship over europe the strength to lead and govern europe testamentarily and conclusively resigned and under the pompous pretence of empire founding effected its transition to mediocritization democracy and modern ideas in very fact i have since learned to regard the spirit of teutonism as something to be despaired of and unsparingly treated as also our present german music which is romanticism through and through and the most ungrecian of all possible forms of art and moreover a first-rate nerve destroyer doubly dangerous for a people given to drinking and revering the unclear as a virtue namely in its twofold capacity of an intoxicating and stupefying narcotic of course apart from all precipitate hopes and faulty apapplication to matters specially modern with which i then spoiled my first book the great dionysian note of interrogation as set down therein continues standing on and on even with reference to music how must we conceive of a music which is no longer of romantic origin like the german but of dionysian seven but my dear sir if your book is not romanticism what in the world is can the deep hatred of the present of reality and modern ideas be pushed farther than has been done in your artist metaphysics which would rather believe in nothing or in the devil than in the now does not a radical base of wrath and annihilated pleasure growl on beneath all your contrapuntal vocal art and oral seduction 
a mad determination to oppose all that now is a will which is not so very far removed from practical nihilism and which seems to say rather let nothing be true than that you should be in the right than that your truth should prevail hear yourself my dear sir pessimist and art deifier with ever so unlocked ears a single select passage of your own book that not ineloquent dragon-slayer passage which may sound insidiously rat-charming to young ears and hearts what is not that the true blue romanticist confession of eighteen thirty under the mask of the pessimism of eighteen fifty after which of course the usual romanticist finale at once strikes up rupture collapse return and prostration before an old belief before the old god what is not your pessimist book itself a piece of anti-hellenism and romanticism something equally intoxicating and befogging and narcotic at all events i a piece of music of german music but listen let us imagine a rising generation with this undauntedness of vision with this heroic impulse towards the prodigious let us imagine the bold step of these dragon slayers the proud daring with which they turn their backs on all the effeminate doctrines of optimism in order to live resolutely in the whole and in the full would it not be necessary for the tragic man of this culture with his self-discipline to earnestness and terror to desire a new art the art of metaphysical comfort tragedy as the helena belonging to him and that he should exclaim with faust und solid ich nicht sensuchtigster gewalt ins leben sehen die existe gestalt would it not be necessary no thrice no ye young romanticists it would not be necessary but it is very probable that things may end thus that ye may end thus namely comforted as it is written in spite of all self-discipline to earnestness and terror metaphysically comforted in short as romanticists are wont to end as christians no ye should first of all learn the art of earthly comfort ye should learn to laugh my young friends if ye are at all determined to remain pessimists if so you will perhaps as laughing ones eventually send all metaphysical comfortism to the devil and metaphysics first of all or to say it in the language of that dionysian ogre called zarathustra lift up your hearts my brethren high higher and do not forget your legs lift up also your legs ye good dancers and better still if ye stand also on your heads this crown of the laughter this rose garland crown i myself have put on this crown i myself have consecrated my laughter no one else have i found to-day strong enough for this zarathustra the dancer zarathustra the light one who beckoneth with his pinions one ready for flight beckoning unto all birds ready and prepared a blissfully light-spirited one zarathustra the soothsayer zarathustra the sooth laugher no impatient one no absolute one one who loveth leaps and side leaps i myself have put on this crown this crown of the laughter this rose garland crown to you my brethren do i cast this crown laughing have i consecrated ye higher men learn i pray you to laugh thus spake zarathustra seventy three seventeen eighteen and twenty sils maria oberregen garden august eighteen eighty six and shall not i by mightiest desire in living shape that soul fair form acquire swanwick translation of faust in the preface